Welcome to Coming to Life, a one-year journey through God's Word. My name is Katie Hawk. We have covered a lot of Israel's history. We read as God's chosen people were rescued from bondage. We learned about their moral decline during the time they were ruled by judges. We talked about their great need for a king. The last few videos have covered the first two kings, Saul and David. The book we are covering today starts with the third king, David's son Solomon. Before we dig in, I want to give you some information about this book. In our Bibles, we have 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Originally, though, these were written as one book. When the Hebrew Bible was being translated into Greek, the translator split the book into two because it was so long. The book's author is anonymous, but tradition tells us it was written by Jeremiah the prophet, who writes a few other books we'll be covering soon. The purpose was to keep a chronological account of Israel's history, although today we read it to learn some lessons from the things they endured so we don't repeat that history. It was written during the time of Babylonian captivity, probably between 560 BC and 540 BC, although the time period it covers is approximately 970 BC to 561 BC. If you were to look at the book as a whole, it would cover just over 400 years of Israel's history. We are going to talk about this book in two sections because that's how it appears in our Bibles. So today we will be looking at the first 117 years. The kingdom is united under David, but he passes away and his son Solomon becomes the new leader, although not without some opposition. Solomon's reign is covered in the first half of this book. Surprisingly, a lot of details we know about him aren't covered, but this is because he's talked about more in 1 and 2 Chronicles. We also get a deeper insight into his character when we read the books he wrote, so you will be hearing a lot more about him in the coming weeks. What we are told is that God came to Solomon during the night and told him to ask for whatever he wanted, and God said he would give it to him. Solomon could have asked for anything, but he asked for wisdom. I think it's important to add, he did not just ask for wisdom in general, but specifically to lead and govern the people. God granted this request and gave him a wise and discerning heart. He was able to govern the people justly. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, wrote over a thousand songs, knew all about plants and wildlife, and people came from around the world to hear him speak. With his wisdom came fortune and honor, unlike anyone had ever had before or has had since. The book details his mass amounts of wealth and explains how Israel is more successful and prosperous than ever. It describes the temple Solomon built for the Lord, which was magnificent. Solomon, in all his wisdom, makes wonderful political alliances with many other nations. The problem is, most of those alliances came with a new wife for him. He ends up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. These women came from places God warned the Israelites never to intermarry with and brought with them their own false gods and idols. They turned Solomon's heart away from God, and he made some terrible mistakes. God is disappointed that he was not a man like his father David, so he vows to tear the kingdom away from Solomon, although because of his love for David, God agrees to wait until after Solomon's death. When Solomon died, the kingdom was passed down to his son Rehoboam, but there was a revolt, and the kingdom was divided, just as God had said. Ten tribes followed a man named Jeroboam, the guy who led the revolt, and formed a nation called Israel, which is also called the Northern Kingdom. This kingdom will be ruled by a total of 19 different kings over the next 209 years. They will then be conquered by the Assyrians and taken into captivity. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin stuck with Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and formed a nation called Judah, which is also called the Southern Kingdom. This kingdom will be ruled by a total of 20 different kings over the next 345 years before being conquered by the Babylonians and taken into captivity. Of the 39 kings to rule these two kingdoms, only six of them were good, faithful men. Although there were two that started off good but turned evil, and one that started off evil and turned good. In the second half of the book of 1 Kings, you will read about 12 of these men. As each king is introduced, the author will tell you if the king did right in the eyes of the Lord or if they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
you will read an account of what happened during their lifetime, how long they reigned. Many of them will end with the words, the other events during the chronicles of the kings of Israel or Judah, depending on which nation they ruled over, are written in the chronicles. This is not referring to the book of Chronicles, which we'll be studying soon, but a book filled with chronological and historical records that we do not have because it was destroyed at some point in history. I'm not going to list each king, but there are a few I wanted to point out. In the Northern Kingdom, every single king did evil in the eyes of the Lord. One of the kings, Zimri, only lasted seven days before being trapped in his palace and committing suicide. Omri, the sixth king, purchased a piece of land from a man named Shemer and made it the political capital of Israel. He named it Samaria. When this region is conquered by the Assyrians, the exiles become known as Samaritans, which you will hear a lot about in the New Testament. You have also probably heard of Ahab and Jezebel, the most wicked couple to ever live. In the southern kingdom, the first two kings were evil, but the next two did right in the eyes of the Lord. They were Asa and Jehoshaphat. Asa led a great revival and brought peace to Judah until a million Ethiopians invaded. He prayed to God and they were miraculously delivered. Jehoshaphat sent teachers throughout all of Judah to instruct the people on God's word. Sadly, he made alliances with three evil northern kings. Although he was rebuked, God heard his prayers and miraculously delivered him from the Moabites. Fun fact, the phrase jumping Jehoshaphat was first used in the 19th century in the belief that it is referring to this king. Although I can't figure out why he's jumping because if you read the story, God tells Jehoshaphat to stand still and let the Lord win the battles for him. We are also introduced to Elijah, one of the most courageous prophets who ever lived. He is supernaturally fed by ravens, brings a boy back to life, predicts a drought, was ministered to by an angel, and challenges false prophets and wins by calling fire down from heaven. Did you know he actually called fire down from heaven three times? His story is one of my favorites, and I encourage you to spend some time studying it. The book of 1 Kings started with a prosperous united kingdom and ended with a broken, divided one. It was written to record the chronological events of Israel's history, but also to show us what happens when we turn away from God. It shows us how important a king is and reminds us of how blessed we are to have Jesus as our king. I hope that the information shared today helps you grasp how interesting the Bible is so you develop a passion for reading it. I pray that as you dig into scripture and go through your workbook, God speaks to you in exciting new ways and your spirit begins coming to life. God bless.